The next speaker is uh, Dr. John Mamarian, uh, who uh, he, everyone knows is one of the most prominent people in the field of nuclear cardiology and cardiac imaging, both CT and nuclear. Great. So today, or for the second talk, I'm going to talk about uh, where CT fits in terms of predicting events. So let's start from the beginning. Predictors of, of ischemia and risk with CT, both contrast and non-contrast, you've already heard from several speakers today about the importance of calcium scoring, depending on the severity of the calcium score. With, with CTA, it really depends on the stenosis severity and the extent of disease, whether it's left main, single, double, or triple. Some positive, uh, uh, some aspects of a, a plaque itself, whether there's positive remodeling, uh, which can actually maybe affect uh, vasodilatory uh, reserve, low attenuation plaque, which may be a surrogate for necrotic core, and spotty calcification. So all these things may also improve our ability to detect and uh, diagnose coronary disease and, and predict outcomes. Lastly, I'm gonna talk about fractional flow reserve in terms of how it fits into all of these others. Now talking about calcium scoring, first of all, we've already heard uh, that uh, calcium scoring is a very uh, good predictor of both low and high risk patients. In low risk patients, an extreme, uh, in patients with calcium scores of zero, an extremely low risk group, calcium scores over three or 400, over 2% per year risk of having a cardiac event. And so in patients with really a calcium score of zero, that is very reassuring and you don't need to have additional therapeutics. We have also uh, shown in this particular series that it, this is true for both men and women. If you look at, at men, uh, as the calcium score goes up, they do worse, and that's also true in women, particularly when you have calcium scores over 400. Uh, we have also shown that in patients with normal myocardial perfusion scans, that the calcium score basically shows the same trends. If you look at a calcium score of zero, a half a percent per year of death or MI, 0.15% per year, and look at patients with a normal myocardial perfusion scan and a severe calcium score. The warranty period of a normal myocardial perfusion scan is really only about three to four years. After that, everything breaks down, and if you have a high calcium score, you do worse. So wouldn't it be better to treat people at, at stage zero after they already have a normal myocardial perfusion scan to hopefully prevent further events down the line? So this is one of the things we were talking about where CT may be very powerful in terms of identifying early disease in patients who may have had a normal myocardial perfusion scan. That could be done with a calcium score, for instance. Here's issues uh, in patients who are symptomatic. You know, there's a lot of talk about CTA is for symptomatic patients, calcium scores for asymptomatic patients, but in mildly symptomatic patients with atypical symptoms, these are all the different trials that have been published over the years, and the bottom line is this. In patients with suspected CAD or chest pain symptoms, low to intermediate risk, none with known CAD or clinical instability, patients with a calcium score of zero, 47% in those kind of trials. If you had a calcium score of zero, only 3% with greater than 50% stenosis, less than 1% with greater than 70% stenosis. And if you look at event rates, not much different from the asymptomatic population who has a calcium score of zero, Mildly symptomatic, calcium score is zero, 0.45% per year event rate. So in those even with mild symptoms, calcium scoring may be enough, may be enough to really say someone is at low risk. What about CTA? Obviously, many, many data on CTA uh, in terms of uh, individual trials and meta-analyses. These are Dr. Berman and Dr. Min's data. You've already seen these, the confirmed data, basically showing that if you have a normal CTA, you do you do extremely well. If you have non-obstructive disease, though, that already increases your risk. And then depending on the severity of disease, in terms of extent, single, double, triple, you do worse. This is a meta-analysis by Halton uh, several years ago, looking at 18 studies in almost 10,000 patients, looking at uh, patients with no CAD, non-obstructive CAD, or obstructive CAD. And if you look at overall MACE, you can see that clearly increases from non-obstructive to obstructive, but most of the events in these particular trials were actually revascularization events. So again, it may be that CT does drive revascularization as well as hopefully preventing other kinds of events. 
These are data from Bittencourt uh, looking at extent of CAD and having a uh, cardiovascular death or MI or a major cardiac event. You can see that goes up with the extent of disease. And obviously, if you have very little disease, you do very, very well by CT in terms of extent. But as you go into more extensive disease, uh, you obviously have a much worse outcome. And so if you look at multivariate predictors in this particular study, extensive non-obstructive CAD, hazard ratio 3.1, extensive obstructive CAD, 3.9. But if you have non-extensive, if you have non-extensive but obstructive CAD, about three. So actually having extensive non-obstructive CAD is really almost as bad as having obstructive CAD, something to keep in mind and why we need to identify patients early to hopefully treat. We also know that CT does have some difficulties in terms of its positive predictive value. We know in terms of negative predictive value, and this is looking at ischemia data in terms of nuclear, uh, either PET or, or SPECT, that if someone has a uh, completely normal CTA, they have a very, very low likelihood of having ischemia. But if they have a positive CTA, only about a third will have ischemia. And that's, again, where fractional flow reserve may come into play. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. We've already talked about the PROMISE study. Uh, obviously, in PROMISE, there was no difference between an anatomic evaluation of patients versus a functional testing, of which most of it was nuclear cardiac testing. In this particular study, however, twice as many patients went on to have revascularization who, in the CT arm uh, as compared to in the nuclear arm. And so despite that number of increased re, uh, revascularizations and increase in intense, uh, invasive coronary angiography, still there was no difference in outcome between functional testing and, non and, uh, and, and CT. So these are things we need to keep in mind. And if you look at the uh, short-term data, uh, at least in 90 days and at two years, uh, there was very marginal differences in terms of cost. So that's probably, that's probably not a major issue. So based on these kind of data, in low to intermediate risk patients, we already heard most of these patients were relatively low risk. Uh, it would appear that CT and functional testing are comparable. Now let's talk about where plaque fits in. This is a patient who had a uh, 30 to 50% stenosis. The patient had positive remodeling. The patient had low attenuation plaque. The patient went for cath and had similar findings as CT. So in this patient with really mild to moderate stenosis, though, there was significant reduction in FFR, OK? So probably by combining these types of anatomic plaque characteristics, we can hopefully identify those at higher risk of having ischemia. These are some data from Matsunyama uh, several years ago. This is looking at patients with high attenuation plaque characteristics or no high-risk plaque characteristics, and you can see the difference in event rates. And this is based on stenosis severity, again, showing a difference in stenosis severity event rates if you have low stenosis severity versus uh, high stenosis severity. This is looking at a combination, and this is looking at the hazard ratios, and you can see the hazard ratios change dramatically. In fact, if you look at this, if you have no high-risk features, you do uh, very well. But if you have both high-risk features, high-risk plaque and stenosis severity, you do very poorly. And uh, what's also interesting about this particular study was looking at progression of plaque. So in patients who had high-risk plaque characteristics but showed no progression of their plaque, they did just as well as patients who didn't have high-risk characteristics. OK? So again, it shows the value of potentially treating patients and preventing progression in terms of identifying low risk and high risk based on these plaque kind of characteristics. Uh, this is another sign that has been shown in, in, in cardiac CT looking at the, what we call the napkin ring sign. And it's not exactly clear what this represents, but it's, it does represent high risk plaque. It probably represents very low attenuation plaque. And in fact, there, if, if you look at the napkin ring sign, which is this lumen, this low density area, and then this higher density area outside the low density, it is associated with both uh, positive remodeling as well as low attenuation plaque. And if you look at the hazard ratios, as you go into this whole uh, concept of positive remodeling, low attenuation plaque, and napkin ring side, the hazard ratios go up with those kind of findings. 
This is just looking at different uh, petition, uh, uh, issues. This is, again, as shown in other studies, positive remodeling picks, uh, picks out a high-risk patient population. Low attenuation plaque picks out a high-risk population. The napkin ring sign picks up a high-risk population. And having both together also picks up high-risk patients. So all of these plaque characteristics are important. These are from data from Dr. Berman's laboratory looking at myocardial ischemia, the detection of ischemia based on plaque characteristics. Very interesting data. And if you look at this, patients with low attenuation plaque and uh, who didn't have low attenuation plaque and who didn't have positive remodeling had a very low likelihood and a very small perfusion defect. But look at patients who had both low attenuation plaque and positive remodeling, a much higher ischemic perfusion effect. And in fact, when you look at some different scores, which are a reflection of the amount of ischemia, again, if you have no low attenuation plaque and no positive remodeling, you, do, you have a very low likelihood of having ischemia, a very small ischemic defect, as compared to those who have both characteristics. So we're learning more and more how these components of CT can come together to help guide us. And just some case examples showing uh, patients as they go from no characteristics to higher characteristics uh, having uh, evidence of ischemia. Another study looking at about 250 patients with suspected coronary disease from de facto. This is an FFR study. Again, looking at different models, looking uh, at, in this particular model, four different models, lesion length, positive remodeling, low attenuation, plaque, stenosis severity scores, and looking at, obviously, different, uh, different models in terms of uh, trying to assess. And what you see is that as you go over greater than 50% uh, stenosis on a CT scan, that increases your risk. But as you add, if you, as you add different components, low attenuation plaque, positive remodeling, and stenosis severity, and then on top of that plaque extent, you see an increase in the likelihood of having an abnormal FFR result, okay? So you might be able to predict an abnormal FFR simply by using all of these anatomic features that you see on CT. Uh, again, this is uh, more data. This is looking at uh, data from uh, Halton, uh, showing how knowing the extent of coronary disease on CT can help guide therapy, OK? So these are in patients, if you look at this, who, who were either treated with statins or not treated with statins, if they had minimal coronary atherosclerotic disease, at least in the short term, over three years, it didn't seem to matter whether they received a statin or not. But in the patients who had extensive coronary disease by CTA, the statin group did much better than the non-statin group. Again, this is observational data. It needs to be confirmed in other areas, but I think it makes perfect sense what we know about statins in terms of being identifying disease early with CT and then moving on. As we know from the FAME data, which is anatomic data, we know that, uh, first of all, as you go from from moderate stenosis up to high-grade stenosis, the likelihood of an abnormal FFR increases. We also know from FAME that if you look at overall results, that a FFR-guided uh, approach to angioplasty leads to a better outcome than just simply an angiographic approach. This is particularly true in terms of not so much death NMI, but in terms of uh, uh, recurrent uh, chest pain syndromes. This has been shown in two-year results. Uh, and in terms of FAME2, which actually compared medical therapy versus intensive therapy, we also see that by using an FR, FR approach to using PCI versus medical therapy, overall patients do better. This is not true in terms of all-cause death. It's not true in terms of myocardial infarction. But the one area where medical therapy fell down was in the issue of recurrent chest pain and the need for urgent revascularization. And in this regard, FFR was a better way of identifying who could, ident who could get angioplasty and who would benefit from angioplasty. There have been several studies in my last few minutes looking at the issue of FFR. And um, this is one of the first ones de facto. And what you'll notice here, and I just want to uh, emphasize a few things, is that if you look at CT, the overall accuracy is around uh, 71%. Where CT tends to be strong is in the negative predictive value. So if you have an FFR greater than 0.8, it's highly unlikely you're going to have ischemia by FFR in the, in the cath lab. Where it breaks down a little bit is in the positive predictive value in terms of a, a, a FFR less than 
uh, 0.8, about a third of those patients, or 25% of those patients, would not have evidence of ischemia. But still, if you look at CT versus FFRCT, you do much better in terms of predicting who is going to have uh, ischemia uh, in the cath lab, both on a per patient basis as well as on a uh, vessel basis. The NXT trial is another a trial that was published, uh, and this was, um, again, looking at, at uh, improved uh, measures of, of uh, measuring FFR. And you see the same kind of results in terms of uh, high sensitivity compared to what you see in the cath lab. The positive predictive value about, about the same, the negative predictive value almost 100%, 92 and greater percent. So again, uh, you see very high correlations between the two in terms of CT and, and, uh, and cath-related FFR. And um, I just want to emphasize that uh, again, if you look at the data, if you have a, if you have a, if you have a, if you have a FFR that's that's uh, greater than than 0.8, you do extremely well in terms of very very low likelihood of having a, a disease that requires revascularization. And again, the uh, the AUC curves would would also show that. This is an example of someone with a moderate lesion. Uh, on CT and on invasive coronary angiography, the FFR by, uh, by invasive coronary angiography was 0.65, by CT it was 0.62. It's another case where you have a, appears to be a high-grade lesion in the right coronary artery. Again, by, by, by uh, invasive coronary angiography, FFR 0.86, FFR CT 0.87. Finally, I'd like to say there's, uh, there are still some ongoing trials that, that this trial has actually been finished, but the data are still not um, published in terms of looking at the value of uh, FFRCT versus nuclear imaging. Uh, this is the Credence trial, and uh, hopefully we should be seeing some data from this study uh, in the near future. There's also the platform study, which has been published, which really showed that if you uh, randomize people to standard uh, non-invasive testing versus CT, uh, you can still avoid uh, uh, coronary angiography in, in most patients using either modality. But this is particularly true in the planned invasive coronary angiography arm, where if you got randomized to CT, uh, over half of those patients never had to go on to have coronary angiography from an invas invasive point of view using fractional flow reserve. And finally, yeah, and finally, uh, these are the data from PROMISE. Uh, as we already said, PROMISE showed no difference initially in terms of uh, anatomic, but there may be some value in terms of using FFR in these populations for identifying who might be best for the cath lab and, who, and in terms of predicting who benefits from revascularization and, and MACE. So I'm going to stop on that note. and. Um, I just want to say that in terms of CT angiography, obviously there are many, many ways in which we can use it. There are now ways in which we can use anatomic assessments and functional assessments, which together should be very informative in terms of identifying who needs to go to the cath lab and who doesn't. Thank you.